In February 1945, the Red Army delivers the people of Budapest from German and Hungarian Nazi terror and allows the city to descend into a state of random mass criminality and Soviet terror instead. During both these rules of oppression and murder, a few men and women stand out for their compassion, sense of duty, bravery, and self-sacrifice that few of us will ever live up to. Among these heroes of humanity are Raoul Wallenberg, Karl Lutz and Giorgio Perlaska. This is episode 128 of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. On February 13th, 1945, the siege of Budapest ends and the Red Army is in control of the Hungarian capital. When I say control, I'm using that word very loosely. The reality is that what can only be described as an unorganized rabble takes over the city, or should I say ruins of the city. Some 80% has been destroyed during the battle. In difference to what is happening at the same time during the invasion of the Reich, the Soviet commanders do try to take tangible measures to rein in the rampant soldiers. There is even an unconfirmed rumor that the commander of the Red Army forces, Marshal Radion Malinovsky, personally shoots a major for raping a Hungarian woman. However, such efforts are hampered by a complete lack of organization and preparation for an orderly occupation. As the siege ends, Swiss diplomat and chargé d'affaires Karl Lutz tries to locate the Soviet commanders to coordinate efforts to give care to the Jewish survivors in the ghetto, whom Lutz and other diplomats have managed to save from extermination. We climbed over burnt-out flamethrowers and tanks in the long tunnel under the castle district, and when we finally reached the Soviet headquarters, we were met by an infernal racket. The officers were celebrating their victory, dancing on the tables, blind, drunk. I was allocated a Ukrainian as guard, but he ran away on the second evening. Dr. Sandor Tonnelli, in charge of District Military Hospital No. 1, will later observe his experiences trying to maintain order at the hospital in the end phase of the siege and its aftermath. In the West, the populations of territories about to be occupied received early radio broadcasts from General Montgomery, instructing them what to do when the British and American troops arrived. After the capture of Budapest, weeks went by without either individuals or the authorities knowing which Russian commander to approach when the need arose. In fact, the Russians themselves did not know. Typically, the first Russian order appeared on February 5th, and the second, marked number one, on February 6th. They were not signed by the commander-in-chief or the city commander, but by a certain Major Nefedov. The result is chaos, and in that chaos there are mass desertions from the Red Army. Within days, an estimated 50,000 deserters have sneaked themselves in among the civilian population. Many of them take up life of crime, living on loot, robbery, and rape. And even among the soldiers who stay in the army, there is widespread looting, systematic rape, and murder. Ferenc Kishont, one of the Jewish survivors in the city, will recall. We thought that the men who had defeated the gigantic National Socialist war machine were superior in military terms. However, all the Soviets we met were just gifted black marketeers and passionate rag and bone men. They were wearing a colorful medley of clothes from the occupied territories. Some were pulling prams filled with plunder from their looting campaigns. Like in the invasion of the Reich, it is women and girls who have to bear the heaviest burden of the Soviet soldiers' victory celebrations. A Swiss embassy report from these days reads, The worst suffering of the Hungarian population is due to the rape of women. Rapes, affecting all age groups from 10 to 70, are so common that very few women in Hungary have been spared. They are sometimes accompanied by incredible brutalities. Many women prefer suicide to these horrors. The misery is made worse by the sad fact that many Russian soldiers are deceased and there are absolutely no medicines in Hungary. But there is also a systematic wave of plunder sanctioned by Moscow. Across the city, bank vaults are emptied of cash by NKVD agents. Private and public art is packed up and sent to the Soviet capital. Already in February, they begin demounting entire factories to be shipped in parts and rebuilt inside the USSR. 
Not even neutral countries' diplomatic legations are spared, another Swiss embassy report reads. Soon after the arrival of the Russians, the head of the Swiss embassy, Herr Harald Feller, and his chief clerk, Herr Hans Meyer, were arrested by the NKVD. They have not been heard from since. The premises of the embassy were looted four times. During one of the raids, a Russian even put a noose around the neck of an embassy employee, Herr Emba, in an attempt to force him to hand over the safe key. When he still refused, the noose was drawn so tight that he lost consciousness. The Russians took the key from his pocket and cleared out the safe, taking deposits worth several million with them. One of the large safes of the Swedish embassy that the Germans had not managed to remove was removed by the Russians with all its contents. Now, while we're on neutral country diplomats, let me backtrack. Remember that Hungary was taken over by a German occupation last spring, and 420,000 of the Jewish people in Hungary were deported and murdered in the Nazi German camp system, most of them at Auschwitz. Then, Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy halted deportations in early July. At this point, a cadre of diplomats from neutral countries launched a concerted effort to save as many of the 120,000 Jews still alive in Budapest as possible. It's an operation that involves several hundred people and is primarily coordinated by Karl Lutz, whom we just met again. The other leading figures are his colleague Harald Feller, their boss Maximilian Jäger, Raoul Wallenberg, and Per Anger of Sweden, Hungarian seminar student Timur Baranski, and Apostolic Nuncio Angelo Rota of the Vatican. Carlos de Lige Tejera Branquino of Portugal, and finally, Angel Sange Brige of Spain and an Italian businessman in his employ, Giorgio Parlasca. In the summer and early autumn of 1944, together they managed to use their diplomatic status to issue passports and shelter tens of thousands of Jewish people still threatened by deportation. When, in early October, the Hungarian Nazi party, the Arrow Cross, depose Horty with help of the Germans, their efforts become all the more frantic. In October, November, and December, even after the siege begins and proceeds, members of the Arrow Cross step up their persecution and murder of the Jews in the two ghettos, the International and the Old Ghetto. Arrow Cross units round up people and shoot them on the shores of the Danube or simply drown them by kicking them into the currents of the mighty river. On top of that, SS Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann continues to make plans to deport the remaining survivors into the Reich in a certain death. Deportations do begin again in October, allegedly to labor service, in reality to Auschwitz. At this point, Wallenberg makes a name for himself as one of the most courageous of the diplomats by physically stepping in front of the Arrow Cross execution squads to stop shootings and intercepting trains destined for Auschwitz. One of his drivers, Sandor Ardai, remembers. He climbed up on the roof of the train and began handing in protective passes through the doors which were not yet sealed. He ignored orders from the Germans for him to get down. Then the Arrow Cross men began shooting and shouting at him to go away. He ignored them and calmly continued handing out passports to the hands that were reaching out for them. I believe the Arrow Cross men deliberately aimed over his head as not one shot hit him, which would have been impossible otherwise. I, I think this is what they did because they were so impressed by his courage. After Valenbay had handed over the last of the passports, he ordered all those who had one to leave the train and walk to the caravan of cars parked nearby, all marked in Swedish colors. I don't remember exactly how many, but he saved dozens off that train, and the Germans and Arrow Cross were so dumbfounded they let him get away with it. By some accounts, Wallenberg manages to convince Eichmann and the German commander in Hungary, Major General Gerhard Schmidhuber, not to force the remaining Jews into a death march in December. Be that as it may, even after the German deportations become impossible, the threat from the Arrow Cross and the SS remains. It will be Perlaska who finally managed to save the remaining 70,000 men, women and children of the Budapest ghettos. Okay, so in early November, Sanjh Brij is recalled to Spain and ordered to close the embassy. He leaves under the cover of darkness without telling Perlasca, who is now left with an abandoned Spanish legation where 3,000 Jews are sheltering. 
When the Aerocross comes to seize the facilities and the Jews, Perlaska improvises and decides to pull off a gigantic bluff. Without any papers to prove it or legal authority, he claims that he has been named temporary chargé d'affaires for Spain until the Sanjbrige returns. The ruse works, and he increases the number of people ostensibly still under Spanish protection to 5,000 during the following weeks. By early January, as the Red Army edges closer and closer to the inner city, the Arrow Cross and the SS decide that the two ghettos must be destroyed and the 70,000 still in there liquidated. The idea is to herd them all into the old ghetto and burn them alive by setting the entire ghetto ablaze. Around January 8th, Perlaska hears of the plan and incensed heads over to the city hall, where the government is now in the cellars. He demands to see Interior Minister Gabor Vanja, who oversees Jewish affairs. He convinces the clerks that it's urgent and is taken to the minister's office. In the waiting room, he finds Valenbay and his Aerocross contact Paul Sali, also looking to see the minister. When Perlaska tells Valenbay that he's got a very urgent issue, he lets Perlaska go in first. When the minister receives him, Perlaska immediately confronts him and asks if the rumors of the plans are accurate. The minister simply answers that, of course they are. Perlaska tries to appeal to his honor, speaks lengthily of Magyar history, and asks if this is what its legacy should be. He pleads and begs in desperation. He can't even hold back his tears and starts crying. But the minister won't be budged. But as the conversation continues, it dawns on Perlaska that there is one thing the Hungarians are worried about future relations with Spain, and in case the Axis lose the war, if the Spanish can help them build ties with the Brits and Americans to evade justice at the hands of the Soviets. That's when Perlaska decides to pull another significant bluff. He tells the minister that if he, as the representative of the Spanish government, does not receive guarantees within 48 hours that Hungary will uphold the agreement to spare the Jews of the ghetto, some 3,000 Hungarian citizens in Spain and more in Portugal and Brazil will be interned, all Hungarian assets in those countries seized, and diplomatic relations damaged for the foreseeable future. It's total nonsense. Of course. There are at most 300 Hungarians in Spain at this time, and as we know, Perlaska is far from being anything close to a representative of the Spanish government. But it works, and Perlaska leaves with the minister's promise to halt the plans, which happens the next day. On his way out, he tells Valenbay in very brief words what he has done, and tells him to, for God's sake, not bring up the ghetto. What then happens in Valenbay's meeting is not known. Still, the Arrow Crossman, Salai, to save his skin from prosecution, will later claim that it was he and Valenberg who intimidated the minister to spare the ghetto. However, Salai's version of events will be full of holes and missing crucial elements unknown to him. Still, by that time, the minister will be dead, Valenberg will have disappeared, and Perlaska, a brave and humble man at heart, will only tell the whole story publicly many decades later. However, Perlaska will already have filed a private detailing of his actions with Italian and Spanish authorities. In any case, that brief encounter in the waiting room is the last time that Perlaska sees Valenbay. On January 10th, he leaves Buda for Pest with some of his staff and driver Vilmos Langfelder. Pest is already under Soviet control, and Valenbay aims to negotiate help to secure the safety of the Jews in the ghetto. Before he leaves Buda, he briefly visits his colleague, Pad Anger. I pleaded insistently with him to suspend his operation and stay with us on the Buda side. The Hungarian Nazis were looking for him, bombs were falling, and when they got into a car to drive, dead bodies, horses, toppled trees, and shattered buildings constantly blocked their way. Anger asked, aren't you frightened? Sure, it gets a little scary sometimes, Valenbay said, but for me there is no choice. I've taken on this assignment and I'd never be able to go back to Stockholm without knowing inside myself I'd done all a man could do to save as many Jews as possible. In the next six days, he works inside Pesh to establish contact with the Soviets. On January 16th, Soviet diplomat Vladimir Dekanozov informs Swedish authorities that Valenberg is under Soviet protection. 
The next day, agents from Smirsch, the Soviet counterintelligence, visit him in his temporary office and tell him that he must come with them to Malinovsky's headquarters in Debrecen to answer allegations of involvement in foreign intelligence. Wallenberg decides to use the opportunity to smuggle a copy of the Auschwitz report to the Hungarian interim government, also headquartered in Debrecen. He packs up the report, and as he and Langfelder leave, the last thing Wallenberg says to his staff is, I'm going to Malinowski's, whether as a guest or a prisoner, I do not know yet. It is the latter. Earlier the same day, Soviet Deputy Minister for Defense Nikolai Bulganin had cabled the headquarters with an arrest warrant for Wallenberg. From Debrecen, Wallenberg and Langfelder are taken by train through Romania to Moscow. On January 21st, they are incarcerated at Lubyanka prison. On January 25th, he is transferred to the Soviet 18th Rifle Corps in Russia, where he is interrogated by agents of the OKR, the third department of Smirsch, tasked with identifying foreign agents working behind Red Army lines. On February 6th, he is transferred back to Lubyanka prison, where he shares a cell with German prisoner Gustav Richter. When Richter is transferred out on March 1st, he is the last person outside the Soviet apparatus to have had direct contact with Wallenberg and will survive to tell the story. On March 8th, 1945, Soviet-controlled Hungarian radio announces that Wallenberg and Langfelder have been murdered on their way to Debrecen, suggesting that the Arrow Cross Party or the Gestapo had killed them. In reality, sometime in March 1945, Wallenberg is transferred to the Le Fortuvo prison, where all reliable evidence of his fate fades away. Still, by most accounts, it seems that he will die there on July 17, 1947, possibly murdered by poison. Langfender's fate remains unclear, but by all probability, he too was murdered or executed sometime in the same period. In the larger picture, there are only two of around half a million people arrested in Hungary and deported to the Soviet Union during the end phase and in the aftermath of the war. Some of them are Nazis, but many are not. Some are detained for their identity, like the 100 to 170,000 of some degree German ethnicity Hungarians. Many are not communists and therefore considered justifiable targets for slave labor to rebuild the war-torn USSR. Others are just happenstance victims of the absurd Soviet political machinery as the 50,000 men arrested at random right after the siege to make sure that Malinovsky fills up his overstated number of 180,000 German and Hungarian POW. Why Wallenberg is arrested and why he was not released remains a mystery. He's not the only one of the diplomats who saved so many of Budapest's Jews who are snatched into the Soviet political prison machinery. As we saw in the Swiss report I mentioned a bit back, in February, Karl Lutz's colleague Harald Fella is also arrested, as is their boss, Maximilian Jäger, and a number of others in the Swiss legation. Per Anger is also detained in February, but is soon released without being transferred to Russia. Seminar student Tibor Boransky, working for the Vatican within the diplomat's effort, was arrested already on December 30th. He is allowed to escape by a sympathetic guard during a foot march through the winter cold and ends up being returned to a hospital in Budapest. In his case, we know why he was arrested. Suspicion of clerical anti-communist activities, for which he will be charged again in three years. His nine-year sentence will be commuted when Stalin dies in 1953. As for the others, a number of explanations have been proposed, but the lowest common denominator seems to be suspicion of ties with foreign intelligence, in other words, US and British intelligence. That is also correct for Wallenberg. While he is formally sent to Budapest as a Swedish diplomat, he primarily works for the US War Refugee Board and has ties to the OSS, which will later become the CIA. However, not only are these organizations allies of the Soviet Union, Wallenberg's work has been focused on saving the Jews of Budapest. If he did anything for the OSS, it was part of the same war effort as the Soviets. 
in difference to him, Fela and Jäger will be released in February 1946 in exchange for Soviet dissidents who had defected to Switzerland. Wallenberg will become what is arguably the most famous missing person of the 20th century. And his exact fate, including the reasons why he was arrested, still remains a topic of speculation 79 years after his disappearance. He will become the poster boy of the bravery and tenacity of the few hundred men and women who in 1944 and 1945 came together to save 120,000 human beings from certain death at the hands of the German and Hungarian Nazis. Their combined effort significantly Wallenberg's readiness to sacrifice himself for others, Karl Lutz's courageous leadership to rally the forces of good, and Giorgio Parlaska's heroic bravado are a beacon of light that shines like a cluster of stars, dispelling some of the darkness of humanity's most frightful night. Never forget. Thank you.